This is Mommying While Muslim, recorded live and unedited. Watch as Zeba and Uzma record their podcast. See their reactions and find out for yourself what all the buzz is about. One of our sponsors this month is Guidance Residential. Take advantage of their spring refinance special and get $500 off with your refinancing. Go to gr.link backslash ram underscore mwm underscore 2021. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Momming While Muslim podcast. This is Osma Jafri. And this is Zeba Hassan, still in her pajamas on the West Coast, still kind of getting used to that West Coast time. But, you know, that we do what we have to do. And as you can see on the screen, we're going to be introducing our um, amazing guest here today. But we're going to push pause on that right now. So I can ask Uzma, like, how is your week going, my dearest? My week is good. But, you know, I have to say your pajamas look way less pajama either uh, mine. Like, I had to get fully dressed. Well, this is like a caftan. So, like, my Moo-moo. Zephyr calls it the Moo Moo's. So Mrs. Zephyr calls Roper it Moo Moo. Yeah, that's what Mrs. I have to. Zephyr, Zephyr calls it the Mrs. Rom- the Roper. He's like, why are you walking around with the Mr. I'm like, I am free. <laughs> and it kind of looks like I'm clothes. And then the white people think I'm dressed when I go downstairs. So guess what? It's a win-win for everybody. Oh my so goodness, you go out in public with the Moo Moo? Oh yeah. Why not? I don't. Yeah. So don't be embarrassed with me when we see each other next week because I'm going to be walking, walking around. around with yes, I am. Because no, nobody knows me. who I am. I have no problem with <laughs> any of that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, tell me about your anniversary because you had a long distance anniversary this week. Well, actually, it's tomorrow. Inshallah, oh. it's our official anniversary and it'll be 22 years Inshallah, mashallah, in the awesome. making. And I have to say, like, you know, he is making his coffee right now, pouring his coffee right now, and he is still as much as he annoys me during corona let's be honest we've been way together way too much time but he is still the love of my life and I definitely appreciate him and as you can see my background is a little bit different because we are in salt not salt lake city where are we now because I've been traveling all over we're in park (laughs) city utah and unfortunately my youngest is sick so this is all I've been able to see of park city but you know you know how moms are yeah. It's a beautiful view. I'm able to get my stuff done and I'm relaxed and I'm actually able to read for fun. And we'll talk about that later, but you have an anniversary mm-hmm. coming up because July is also this famous anniversary. Muslims decide to get married yes. in July. In summer, because we can get those hauls for cheap. Uh, my anniversary <laughs> was, what is today? Friday it was Wednesday. Yes. Um, so we celebrated Alhamdulillah 15 years and oh, happy anniversary. You know, I wanted to go overseas, but like the passport office has, um, it's really interesting. Both of us sent our passports in together to get renewed because his was about to expire. Mine expired in August and didn't see the need to do it anytime sooner during Corona. He got his back and they kept mine. Like Hmm. there's something wrong with mine. So it's been with them since June 3rd. And now the turnaround is like 18 months. So we couldn't go anywhere cool. Um, but we did, we went to Seattle. So that was kind of nice. Seattle yeah, for one night. <laughs> did you see, did you get the coffee? Did you go to the original Starbucks? I saw or the original Starbucks, but it's Starbucks. like, I, I don't feel the need to go get stand in an hour and a half, two hour line Mm-mm. to go get original Starbucks when I can get it any old time. It's in my fridge right now. So exactly. I, I and it's okay. overpriced and it tastes like dirt. Taste sorry. It's not I'm good. sorry to admit that. Mm-hmm. I do not like Starbucks. I'd rather have my Dunkin' Donuts coffee Dunkin any Donuts. day of the week. CD. And they are not sponsoring us, but they can if they want to. <laughs> um, so we are going, to, you know, so before, you know, we normally do a soapbox and obviously Uzma does the soapbox today, but because we have an Emmy award winning journalist here today, one of my favorite people in the world, I am going to introduce her and then have her talk a little bit about a soapbox issue that we all should be brought um, brought in awareness of. So August launches our Muslims in the News series, and we definitely need some representation right now. So we'll be talking to amazing mamas in journalism, print, and other types of media. Um, And the first person to kick this off, obviously, is one of my favorite people, uh, my friend Layla. And she is like, you know, like this Emmy Award winning journalist. I'm so proud to know her, super humble. And I will go ahead and continue her bio after. She tells us a little bit about her soapbox, which I feel is very important because, you know, just because it's not in the news and it's not being covered doesn't make it any less important. So Layla, thank you so much for being with us here on Mommy Mom Muslim. And tell us a little bit about what you feel our listeners should know about. 
Thank you so much for having me, Zayv and Uzma. It's I'm such a fan of the podcast. You guys do such amazing work and it's such an honor to be on. Um, and I want to go back and listen to your old episodes to hear all of Uzma's soapboxes. <laughs> They're <laughs> great, but you know, we have to rein, rein her in sometimes. <laughs> I don't blame her. There's a lot to be frustrated about. So I don't blame her at all, especially during COVID. Um, so my soapbox this week is actually not something that's specific to this week, although a lot has happened this week. So um, we all know that in May, um, Israel launched an offensive, an air offensive on um, Gaza um, against Palestinians living on the Gaza Strip. Um, uh, at least 66 children were killed at the time and um, more than 200 Palestinians total, including uh, women as well as um, many civilians. Uh, we saw the images out of there, mostly on social media. They were horrific. We saw the um, Al-Qawlaq family, for example, who lost 22 members of one family. Just this week, there was a Human Rights Watch report that showed um, that Israel showed wanton disregard for the lives of civilians when they launched these attacks. And um, I think What's really important to note is so much is happening on the ground, whether it's home demolitions, settlement expansions, um, young Palestinian children being arrested and detained and held. Um, just two days ago, Israeli soldiers killed an 11-year-old Palestinian boy named Mohammed Abu Sara. Uh, yesterday at his funeral, Israeli soldiers shot and killed his 20-year-old cousin Khaled Awad. We don't hear about this unless you're on social media, mm -hmm. you're on Twitter, we're not getting breaking news alerts on our phone. Mm -hmm. It's not the top news. Um, and I think, sadly, it's a broader reflection of the fact that Palestinian lives don't seem to carry much weight when it comes to what the powers that be in newsrooms around the country and in international newsrooms um, determine as newsworthy. Obviously, you have exceptions to that. Al Jazeera is an exception. You know, websites like Middle East Eye that tend to focus much more on what's happening day to day. But I think the message that comes across is um, it, this only matters if Israelis are in danger. So when Hamas mm -hmm. is firing the rockets, that's when it's newsworthy because Israeli lives are in danger. Otherwise, the day-to-day -day violence and indignity of the occupation doesn't seem to merit much coverage. And what that means is viewers are not getting a full, or readers are not getting a full picture of what's actually happening on the ground, which is that Palestinians are subject to daily humiliation, violence, detention, home demolitions that ends up um, leading to the, you know, to, for example, things like rockets being fired. But you end up getting that news completely decontextualized from the day to day mm -hmm. indignities of this illegal occupation. And, you know, I think this is something that really does people a disservice because people don't end up really having a clear picture of what's actually happening on the ground. That's 100%. And, and, you know, we've been follow we have been following it pretty closely um, here at Mommy Well Muslim because it is something that is um, near and dear to us. Um, and, you know, we will go ahead and I think Osma will share some of the resources that Layla has actually um, um, shared with us today in our show notes, because I do think getting that unbiased news uh, is is actually in a very important thing for everybody who's trying to get to know a little bit about what's going on there, because we only do see that one-sided um, part of what's going on. And I think the more we know, the better we can actually do. And this is the one time I do have to say, thank goodness for social media. I mean, honestly, social media has been the bane in my existence for a very long time, but this is one of the things where it can actually show things on the ground from the point of view of the people that are actually experiencing it. So this is the one time social media, and I think that's why we are even hearing about it at all, to be honest with you, is this, this younger generation is using social media as a platform to kind of bring awareness to what's going on on the ground there. So I do have to say for these younger generation, keep doing what you're doing because we're learning from you and we definitely appreciate that. 100%. And like, you know, I've been livid this week, not only because of the murders of these two children, actually, I think it was three kids um, mm. that were shot and killed by soldiers this week, including um, the one whose funeral was happening and his cousin. But um, I think the night before, on my anniversary, early morning, mm. the IDF broke into the offices of the defense for uh, the defense DCIP, which is Defense for Children in Palestine. And what they do is um, they represent Palestinian children, because remember, Palestine is like, well, not the only country, but like the only 
democratic nation that is allowed to arrest minors like overnight mm-hmm. zip tie blindfold them and take them in for questioning without their parents there it's again it violates international law and they get away with it over and over again so what did the dcip find um probably information about these uh, at least the two murders that happened before the break-in happened um what were they afraid that the world was going to find mm-hmm. out that they went in there and stole like eight laptops and you know cut the feed from the video cameras in like eight minutes, eight minutes after they broke in, but they stole all kinds of files, left no receipt, no warrant, nothing. You know, there was nobody in the DCIP office when they did this. And, you know, they do it with complete disregard for um, any kind of human rights and civil rights of Palestinian people. And I mean, these are minors records and their cases that have been taken away. So they can be held for months and months. I don't remember how many months, um, was her name? I forgot. Tamimi. Oh yeah. Girl, oh. That they had arrested a couple of years ago for slapping. And Rahid Tamimi. Rahid Tamimi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for how many months they had her? But that could happen to your minor child. To you know, as young as seven or eight, they will take them oh into God. these vans, not with their parents, and to like a military outpost their police stations and like they are violating these kids physically, emotionally, putting stuff in Hebrew in front of them and making minors sign it. And that is held up in military court. So basically the kids are Mm -hmm. signing away confessions that they did worse than just throwing rocks at heavily armed militarized police. So um, I don't know. I would think that David and Goliath would matter in Israel, but apparently it doesn't. And the David and the Goliath, like, it's very easy to know who it is in this situation, especially when you look at the bombing of Gaza. So, yeah, I'm, rein me in, rein me in. This is my soapbox, too. But you can check out my stories uh, on social media about the DCIP break-in this week. And um, Zeba, you uh, gave Layla the soapbox. Now tell the audience why she's she the is. one way more qualified to do this exactly. than I am. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. I'm like, you know, the fact that we're starting this Muslims in the News series, I'm like, you know what? We're, this, we're going to change it up a little bit this month um, to kind of give the power back to the people that actually deserve it. Because, you know, we had um, Layla's, first of all, you can, her, their voices even sound kind of similar, which is so cute with sisters. So we had her sister, Lena Alarian, on um, before, if you if you remember our episode, um, I think it was about like two years ago, right, Asma? Like, Muslims Muslims under surveillance. Um, but this is her uh, amazing sister, Layla, who graduated from Columbia with a master's degree in journalism. She has written several, several national and international news publications. She is the writer and documentary filmmaker based out of DC. She has co-authored Collateral Damage, America's War Against Iraqi Civilians, based on an investigative piece she did, I believe it was in 2007. She is now the executive producer of Al Jazeera English, where she investigates, um, doc- she creates creates documentary series that investigates um, different types of issues in the area. And it's called Fault Lines, which, by the way, I loved. I actually watched her piece on, um, I think it was like the, what is the opiate use? I was like, Florida by that. That was one of my favorite ones. Um, her work has actually earned her two news and documentary Emmys and a Peabody Award. And that is why she took on the soapbox today. Welcome, Layla. Asalaamu Alaikum. And it's so nice to have you on the show. Finally, finally <laughs> have you, you so on the much. show. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Alaikum. Welcome. I've heard from the grapevine that your husband has wanted to come on the show. And if, you know, if that's the situation, he can blame me because I've always been like, no men. You know, if anyone is qualified to be on mommying while Muslim, it's <laughs> you. <laughs> He's like, um, when are you going to have me on the show? I'm like, you're not a mom and never. So yeah. thank you very much. I mean, you're super cool. Like maybe we'll ask you for your expertise for those who don't know Jonathan Brown, uh, an American scholar who I actually lecture about and include in my um, Islam 101 lecture. I'm like, oh, if you ever want to look up, you know, a Muslim scholar, here's Jonathan Brown. Um, so uh, he happens to be her husband. Um, and he usually- might just pop in, guys, just to oh, make okay. <laughs> come just to make a point. <laughs> like, hey, I belong on Mommy Muslim. That's hilarious. <laughs> so usually, Layla, we kick off the show by asking our guests um, whatever they're comfortable sharing about their kids, basically their momming story and their momming mm-hmm. philosophy. Great. Um, so I have two boys, Mazin and Hashim. They're eight and six years old. Well, one of them... Um, 
the older one just celebrated his half birthday yesterday. So it's eight and a half and six and a half. It, those half uh, years matter for them. Let me tell you right now. They really do. <laughs> they, at that really for do. us, we're like, uh, yeah, I want yeah, no, push back. I, I'm going <laughs> to lose a couple of years, but no, they're like, give me that extra half year. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, they, you know, um, they're great kids. I don't know. I feel, inshallah. I feel like, inshallah. I feel like being a mom is just the most meaningful job I've ever done. Um, it just brings me so much joy and fulfillment with all the challenges that are involved. I think somebody told me when I, when my kids were really, really young that the challenges never stop. They just change and in some ways get more complicated and um, serious. And that's definitely been the case for me. I think you know, those early years, you're just trying to keep them alive and mm-hmm. you're trying to, you know, bathe, like you're in this like routine that almost feels like you're just like on a treadmill and you're in the routine and, you know, bathe, clothe, feed, um, yes. change diaper. <laughs> and then as they get older, it's, I think what, what becomes so stressful as a mom. And I think it's something that we're probably all dealing with one way or another during COVID is just the emotional mm-hmm. needs that kids have and how do you navigate that? And, you know, I think, um, my, I guess my philosophy by Havlin is to just, um, know that so much is not in our control. Um, and I think it's a lesson I had to learn early on both of my kids. Uh, neither of them came on time. Like one was a week late, one was two weeks early. And I think that's mm-hmm. a very early lesson and like, they're going to do what they want to do and they're going to be born exactly. with their personalities. And, you know, I think, um, what is in your control just like being really present when they are with you um trying to kind of create boundaries between work and and just home life which has been really really tough during the pandemic i think mm-hmm. there's all these studies of how you know people are working so much more and i feel like i'm definitely yes. in that camp so i've had to consciously especially after taking some time off this summer and kind of resetting i've come back and i'm like okay I don't want to work as much as I did before. I need to kind of really carve out time where I'm just focusing on the kids and I'm not like on my phone or like checking Twitter or whatever, when I'm supposed to be focusing on them. And I think other than that, it's just constantly seeking information. Like if I'm dealing with a certain challenge with the kids, like, okay, reading as much as I can, asking friends for advice, asking experts and just you know, trying to kind of figure it out. I think a lot of it is instinctive, but for me, I like to kind of read up and, you know, within reason, <laughs> not the go- Dr. Google stuff, but like, within exactly. <laughs> and just like, okay, how do I, how do I deal with this challenge and how can I help my kids? I think one thing I learned and Zeba, I'm sure you understand Zeba and I sent um, our kids to the same school for a while. Mm-hmm. It's like, and Zeba told me this, um, you have to be your own child's advocate because mm-hmm. no one else is going to do that for you, especially in a big school system where your kids yes. could get lost. So um, just trying to like really communicate with the teachers, being on top of stuff, like uh, being proactive because mm-hmm. the teachers won't be <laughs> most of the no. time. All love to teachers, but they have a lot right. on their plate. They have mm-hmm. a lot on their plate. And honestly, no one's going to know your kid better than you. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the big, that's actually the big thing. And I love that you said that because I do feel um, the, one of the things that I've noticed in the Muslim community specifically is they don't, they don't necessarily feel like they can be their child's advocate in a school system. So trying to promote that and encourage that, or like what was much just totally pulling her kids out of the school system. Cause she's like, I'm done with all of that. Um, you know, there are different ways for us to do it. You know, we can do it, go the Uzma route. You can go your route, you can go my route where we kind of do like a hybrid, but really trying to be the, the biggest advocate for your kid is my number one advice that I give to people. My husband actually homeschooled our um, mm-hmm. second grader um, yeah. last year, and that was interesting. I think. Yeah, I was going to say, how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're really actually similar in personality in, in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. and I think in that sense it worked because he gets him. Um, I think for me as the mom, and you know, I had to make a conscious decision early on, like, okay, this is his thing. And if I stress out about it or try to interfere, um, it's not going to be good or try mm-hmm. to get in the way of his process. And that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Like we need to exactly do it and keep expectations in check and focus on whatever learning is happening. Exactly. And he may not get all the science and social studies that I expect, but that's okay. Like, getting exactly. the basics, you know, so 
I, yeah, I definitely had to let go and, you know, put a lot of faith and trust in my husband. And, you know, I think that there's no replacing that individual one-on-one attention. Um, exactly. So and for the record, just as an FYI, he is a Georgetown college professor. That kid's getting social <laughs> studies. So he's getting Believe something. <laughs> He is. Layla's Layla, like, I don't Arian know. And Jonathan Brown's kid is getting social studies. They're knowing what they're going to do, and they're going to be, you know, pioneers in their field. And I am not doubting that for one second. So I we'll love see. that you gave up. I love that you doubt it, Layla. <laughs> she was like, I'm not sure about whether he's going to be getting there. I'm like, I think he will be just fine. And recognizing, by the way, another thing for us parents to write, we're in a global pandemic. Yeah. period. It yeah. sucks. There's nothing we can do about it. And we're all doing the best that we can. And let's say for worst case scenario, our kids graduate from college or school two years later. Mm-hmm. Is that the end of the world? I told myself at the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, this is going to be tough. And my metric for success is let's just survive this year. Exactly. And let's like really adjust expectations and exactly. like, let's try to find moments of joy and relief. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my, like, we focused a lot on just doing physical activity as much as possible. Yes. Go outside and bike. Exactly. You know, my husband got a rope swing. Like, go on the rope swing. Exactly. Like, let's take walks. Um, let's take hike. We did so many hikes, like way more than I ever imagined. And my but husband, guess what? What an amazing he, thing to do with your family, and you're going to remember that. Yeah, definitely. But my husband tortures us. Like, he's all about going off the beaten path, oh, no. which oh, means no. like going up really steep. <laughs> yes. Did you do the Billy Goat Trail? We did. Oh my God. I got so many bruises from that trail because I was like falling. It's because we weren't prepared for that. It's like this intense trail in a, in the great falls area. And my son wanted to do it. And I have bruises Oh no! because you're slipping and you're falling if you're not prepared. So, but you know what, what an amazing thing for your kids to look back on. Yeah. So many memories. So yeah, there were two things that you said that stuck out to me. And one was, you know, you have one Emmy's in a Peabody and mothering is your favorite job. So to all the moms who, you know, maybe you don't earn money outside of the house, but you're working, you know, and that job is really rewarding to anybody, regardless of what field you're in. Like all of us, our primary job occupation and love is mommy. And then the second thing you alluded to was, um, just trusting ourselves. I think both of you Mm -hmm. kind of talked about that. And a lot of moms, again, regardless of whether we have a, you know, a paying job or not, you know, we all question ourselves, like, am I Mm -hmm. enough? Am I enough? And I think that, you know, again, somebody with your qualifications, wondering that this year in the pandemic, and then all of us finding out that yes, we are, you know, yes, we are. And we always were, we didn't trust ourselves, like in the school systems, not just to be advocates for our kids, but also, you know, Zeba, especially I've learned this from is that we know our kids best. Mm -hmm. I grew up believing or being told that our teachers, because they spend the Mm -hmm. entire day with us, they know us best. And maybe that's true for some kids, you know, and I'm not going to make a blanket statement all or none. But what I'm saying is generally, as moms, um, we do, we Mm -hmm. are the best advocates for our kids, we are knowledgeable about our kids. But, you know, after the whole period of the treadmill and just doing the keeping them alive routine when they're really little as they grow up, are we tuning in? Are we paying attention outside of the pandemic? Are we going to take that time to take that hike, to kind of cuddle on the sofa and mm-hmm. watch a movie just for the sake of watching a movie? Like a Tuesday night movie is okay. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. know, you don't have to wait until Friday or Saturday. Are we talking to the kids and having hard conversations? Are we talking to them, to them about what's in the news? And so to that end, um, I'd like to kind of bring it back to, you know, um, your journey, maybe your a little bit about your family history, whatever you're willing to share. And I know uh, this is more for the benefit of anybody who didn't hear the episode with Lena, your sister, um, a little bit about that and how that informed your journey into journalism. And, you know, what was that path that you took in order to get where you are today? Sure. Yeah. Um, So I was born in the U.S. in North Carolina. We moved to Florida when I was pretty young. Um, So most of my childhood memories are in Florida. Um, And, you know, my dad was a computer engineering professor, but his real passion is politics, whether it's like U.S. electoral politics or what's happening in Palestine. So his father was actually a refugee 
um, expelled, forcibly expelled from um, his hometown of Jaffa or Yaffa in 1948. Uh, my father kind of grew up all over the Middle East, as did my mom, both descendants of refugees from that generation that was forcibly expelled and ethnically cleansed from the land. And I think, you know, in their minds, like they, it was always, they always knew they were Palestinian. They were treated differently than everybody else in all the Arab countries they lived in. My dad um, never turned his back on his people. So even though he was able to come to the U.S. at the age of 17 and study and become a professor and like help support his family, he always wanted to advocate on behalf of Palestinians, uh, advocating for their human rights, for their equality, for the end uh, to the occupation. So I grew up in a house where the news was on all the time. Mm -hmm. CNN was blasting. My dad would get the the news weeklies, um, Newsweek, uh, Time magazine, and I just became this like news hound. Like I would watch the news, um, you know, the images of the first Gulf War in uh, 1990, 1991 were like um, always, you know, the Palestinian Intifada as well uh, in the late eighties were, you know, I was consuming that. And I knew early on, um, you know, I would go to third grade and, and my classmates would be like, what side are you on? Like Iraq or, um, uh, Kuwait. And I'd be like, neither one. <laughs> like, exactly. And this so, is why. <laughs> I'm American. So, that's why. <laughs> exactly. So my parents were like from a very early age like, teaching us like nuance and how to kind of like discern what's really happening and, and sift through um, the news coverage. Um, and I knew early on, like from a very young age, like, okay, we're seeing these images from Palestine, but the American public isn't quite understanding what's happening, even though just because something is receiving coverage doesn't mean that people are understanding or seeing the reality or understanding the full picture. And I knew that the news coverage was very biased, heavily biased against the Palestinians and that um, you really have to have a presence in the media in order to make that change, to bring your 100%. perspective. Um, and that's just something uh, I think I was I ha- we have old home videos and I'm nine years old acting like a news anchor. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> it was, they're kind of cringy and embarrassing, but, <laughs> you know, um, so that was just something that was, you know, in my life. And then I think at the age of 12, I had, I think we can all look back on that one teacher that really mm-hmm. had us thinking um, and inspired us in some way. So I had a, a um, sixth grade teacher who had us do an assignment telling us like, what do you want to be when you grow up and explain why? And at that point I was like, I want to be a journalist. And on a very base level, I was very nosy. So I always just wanted okay. to know what was going on. <laughs> um, and I was like, hmm, if you're nosy and you love the news, then this is a good job. And I love to write and I love to read. Um, when I was in college, I actually um, focused on English literature as a major. So I basically got to read a bunch of amazing novels and as, as like my college experience. But, um, you know, I think it's just something it's, it's not an easy field, like um, just pursuing it. There came with so many challenges. My dad, after 9-11, was actually arrested and charged um, for his work um, on behalf of Palestinians um, in, in this big terror, quote unquote, terrorism case. Um, And that really, I was a very recent college grad. I was 21 years old when all this happened. And I ended up going from trying to focus on like starting out in my career to actually advocating uh, for my Mm -hmm. dad. And that took many years of my life. And obviously what that meant was, especially in this post 9-11 environment where American Muslims were viewed with suspicion, where my own family was struggling um, with this big case you know, the, the, at the time in 2003, the attorney general of the U.S. actually went live on TV and announced my, the indictment against my dad and three other mm. men who were arrested. So it was very high profile. Meanwhile, I'm trying to mm. enter the field. Yes, but the same the, name. Exactly. The same name, wearing hijab, post 9-11, like they're trying to, um, the same media that's like reporting against my dad in like a very biased and sensationalistic way. So it was really wild and like really stressful and came with so many challenges. And I think one lesson I learned early on is you kind of have to adjust your expectations and your dreams. It's something you can apply to parenting as well. Exactly. (laughs) My dream growing up was to be a foreign correspondent for like the New York Times or the Washington Post and go abroad and report. And then obviously these same publications in this post 9-11 environment where Muslims were viewed as the enemy and Mm -hmm. suspicion and you know we're not necessarily going to hire me so 
you know, I had this whole long journey of like adjusting expectations. You know, I, I started out um, as an intern at a magazine called the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs and wa- based in DC. It was founded by former State Department diplomats who um, lived in the Middle East and could see how biased and skewed Mm -hmm. most U.S. mainstream coverage of Israel-Palestine was. So they moved back to D.C., opened up the small magazine. It was like a staff of like 10 people. I joined it very early on. I think I made $18,000 a year in my first job. Yes. (laughs) Barely paid the rent. Um, We all had that first job. We all had that first job. I had like multiple roommates, like on different Aww. schedules, roommate conflicts. Anyway, then I worked for a local newspaper in the DC area where irony alert as the hijabi on staff, I was covering liquor license regulation um, <laughs> and like okay. having to attend like city council meetings where they were like deciding on whether to grant a liquor license to like this restaurant. And like, you know, I think you have all these dreams as a young person, like I want to go and I want to cover the Iraq war, like um, for a major newspaper. Instead, I'm covering grouchy um, neighborhood association meetings where people are complaining about rat infestation <laughs> and <laughs> DuPont Circle, like, uh, I don't know. Especially in DuPont Circle, for Especially sure. In DuPont Circle, <laughs> rat, graffiti. They're like, there's too much graffiti on the walls. <laughs> and, you know, I think I was like, okay, that's all right. I'm going to do the best possible job I can do on the rat infestation in DuPont circle. And that's okay. And you know, this is what I'd like to tell young journalists is like, you, it may not be as glamorous as you think, and that's okay. Like gain those skills, do as good of a job as you would on, you know, this neighborhood meeting as you would covering this really big glamorous story Mm -hmm. and um, adjust your expectations because this is also a very volatile industry. Like when I graduated from journalism school is when there were so many layoffs happening mm-hmm. and I did print in journalism. Exactly. School. Aha, print, where's print? Like, print anymore, they're, yeah. They're hemorrhaging jobs. Like there's just no opportunities. There's especially no opportunities if your dad is being charged with terrorism <laughs> oh and you wear hijab and it's post 9-11. And, you know, so I think, you know, when, when jo- an opportunity opened up for me at Al Jazeera English, which was TV, and I never imagined working in broadcast, it wasn't necessarily my dream. I was like, okay, that's fine. That's who's hiring. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do the best possible job. And I'm going to prove that, that to them that I can do it. And, you know, you just sort of take the opportunities where they come. And, and you know, I tell people just have a positive attitude and, yeah. you know, don't be entitled. <laughs> Uh which is hard to say for this younger generation let's just be real so we have to kind of we as parents of this next generation we have to manage their expectations and I'm saying this to all the moms that guess what it's not going to be fun sexy you're not going to get everything that you want because you're doing your kid a disservice by allowing them the opportunity to feel that entitlement because guess what I always tell my kids when you walk out that door no one's going to love you like me Mm -hmm. sorry (laughs) I tell them too. I'm like, you're special to me, but to Not nobody to else. Anybody else. <laughs> they, they owe you nothing. Technically, it's, I owe you nothing either because the rent for my I uterus you. is just, you know, I, I, you we will never be able to pay it. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but, you know, all of this that you went through led you now to being the executive producer of an amazing documentary series. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about that so that they can all watch? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So back in 2012, um, what's funny is I feel like for me, I've always been kind of forced (laughs) in one way or another into like my next opportunity. I don't, I think like a lot of women, I don't, I didn't necessarily think like, oh, I could do this. Like, let me go for it. Like, exactly. I basically lost my job in the news department at (laughs) Al Jazeera English in DC. I was in news. I was working on like 24 hour, you know, on a broadcast center. They started, um, shutting down the office as a broadcast center and instead shifting operations to two other London and Doha, basically two other offices. So I was one of the people who basically I lost my job, but they wanted to keep me as the, you know, the network wanted to keep me. So they shifted me onto this documentary series. Um, And I just worked really, really, really hard. And this is a lesson that I try to instill in my own kids. Like Mm -hmm. you can have whatever natural talent you have or whatever skills or smarts but there's no substitute for just working really hard um Mm -hmm. so 
I did that. And my impetus was to basically prove that I could do it um, because I didn't have the background or the experience necessarily to make documentaries. Um, But I also just started thinking like, I watch documentaries. Um, right. What do I enjoy when I watch a documentary? Exactly. That's what I'll do when I make the documentary. Like I'll make whatever I would want to watch. And that kind of approach seemed to work. It did. You know, there's no magic in this. There's no, you just kind of have to figure it out. A lot of it is instinctive. Um, and, you know, I started my first documentary was actually about abortion restrictions and I was pregnant, which was very ironic. Right. <laughs> but, um, And, you know, people have all sorts of being a Muslim, being visibly Muslim, all sorts of um, assumptions about you that you're biased towards one thing or the other. um, Exactly. Which ends up kind of opening doors weirdly. But um, I, you know, I I worked really hard. I went from being a producer to a senior producer. And then eventually when my former uh, executive producer left in 2017, I kind of stepped up in the role and then applied for his position, became the head of the show and... Um, you know, it's definitely not come without challenges. I think um, for some people, see, you know, it, they don't necessarily um, respect your authority or position as a, a woman of color in the way that they mm-hmm. would as a white man. And I think yes, I've been surprised. <laughs> Thankfully, um, the you know those challenges have been um, not like it hasn't been most of my experience, but early on, I kind of had to navigate some of those challenges of, um, you know, trying to, to get that same respect that um, another person in that um, sort of leadership position would get. Um, But, you know, otherwise, I think my true passion is journalism and telling stories that no one is necessarily telling and highlighting, giving voice to people who may not have a platform or may not have a you know, an opportunity to tell their own stories otherwise. So I think a lot of the stories we tell are, um, we're based in Washington, D.C., so we tell stories mostly in the U.S. If we go overseas, it has to have a strong U.S. connection. So, for Mm -hmm. example, last year we did an episode about how civilian casualties in Afghanistan were rising a lot under the Trump administration Mm -hmm. and how so many civilians are being killed in military airstrikes, but those incidents weren't being investigated by the military. Um, you know, we talked to families who lost like many members of their families in these airstrikes who said the U.S. military never came to talk to them, never investigated, and that some of these incidents weren't even being officially logged as civilian casualties. Uh-uh. Um, so that's one example of like an overseas story we did um, after I had my oldest son, Mazen. Um, just a few months later, I was on a plane to Bangladesh where we were looking into how companies like Gap and Walmart basically take advantage of cheap labor. Mm -hmm. They operate, um, you know, to maximize their profits in these really dangerous factories, facilities, um, and pay the workers dirt wages. And I remember Mm -hmm. I was still nursing Mazin. And this other mom was like, just take a manual breast pump. You'll be fine. And you're I like, go, no. And then I, I believed it. I go, oh, no. Weather, but like, we're working like 18 hour days. <sighs> We we're like the traffic alone was like three hours each way just to like go across town and my milk basically like evaporated. Oh, that's and I remember worst. just being so heartbroken. Like I was like, it's my first baby. I really wanted to nurse him. And even before that, like I was just like, you know, your hormones are all over the place. And I was like, yes. how am I going to leave my baby and go all the way to Bangladesh to do this assignment? And my sister was like, look, you know, I know you're really sad, but you're telling the stories of moms, Mm -hmm. you know, moms who either were injured in in this factory fire who died and who left their children behind. Um, And, you know, that's one way to look at it. And, you know, I think as much as like, it's tough for me to have been away from my kids during these work trips, like just remembering that we're telling stories of people who are also moms who yes. are also going through, you know, much more than I'm going through is kind of like humbling and grounding. And, and trying to keep it in perspective. I mean, that's, and, and for the record, the, the name of the documentary series is called Fault Lines and um, it's, it's amazing. And like you said, it tells a story and it, and it kind of hooks you from the very beginning. And I personally, it's one of our go-to um 
our go-to documentary series, that and the, the new one we're talking about was that t- my kids are learning about the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic rule in Ottoman Empire right now. Because I'm like, when we're sitting together watching documentaries is a kind of a good way for us to kind of open that communication. They can ask questions. And weirdly, my younger two are obsessed with all kinds of wars. I don't know how that happened. So we're just, we're, we're, we're treating them to the wars from the very beginning. But you mentioned a little bit about how your your job as a journalist or, or your career, I should say, because this is definitely more of a career and a passion of yours since you were literally talking in front of the TV or in front of the mirror, pretending to be a newscaster at the age of nine, which is so amazing. And, and the blending of your mom world with you being two weeks out or a couple months out and having to leave to, to go case a story. How do you manage to create a balance. And I know you, you alluded to it a little bit in the beginning of this um, episode where you were saying, you know, with COVID, the lines have been blurred and you're trying to find a little bit more of that balance. But when you are having such a high profile job and career, and you're also the mom at home, how are you blending that and making it work? Because I know work-life balance is a misnomer. Let's just be real about that. But we all are trying to do the best that we can on a day-to-day basis. How are you balancing that um, for people, for women specifically that want to go into this field later on and also want to be a mother? I'll be honest. I feel like I'm failing most of the time. Then that means you're doing a good job. When you feel like you're failing everything, you're probably doing something (laughs) right. I (laughs) hope so. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think taking this uh, a bit of time off during the summer and traveling um, helped me reset a bit because I do feel like sometimes I I get, I have like workaholic tendencies and I get Mm -hmm. too caught up in work and, you know, I'm not spending enough time with the kids. And I think when they're young, you have no choice, right? Like Mm -hmm. you're keeping them alive. You're doing tummy time or you're, um, Mm -hmm. you have to, you have to supervise them. It's when they get older and they can go off and do their own thing that like, you have to kind of take that conscious decision to say, okay, put limits on screen time. Yes. um, And really carve out time to spend with them. I think for me, what I've tried to do, and again, I feel like I'm failing most of the time is my mornings um, focus on them at breakfast time, you know, before I start my work day, whether it's, um, you know, I asked my son the other day and, and I have to say like my, I'm very fortunate because my husband does so much and without his support, I don't think I could do it because Mashallah. Alhamdulillah, like I'm very, very fortunate. Um, he's a very hands-on dad. He's constantly stepping up and, you know, spending time with the kids, taking them out, um, making them breakfast sometimes, you know, whatever it is, I think um, it's I, I, like, I'd be lying if I said like, oh, I just happen to have this career and be a mom and, and it's worked out like truly um, in order for me to be able to do my job, I need support from family, whether it's my husband or, you know, we've over the years, we've been able to have some other family living with us, um, which is not going to be the case this year, <laughs> which will be interesting. But um you know, I think it's really trying to carve out time and that's like your sacred time and you can't be on social media or um, getting distracted during that time and, and really focusing on them and trying to hear them out. Um, a few months ago, I felt like I wasn't um, as connected to my older son, especially because his dad was homeschooling him and, you know, I just wasn't seeing him as much. So I, I said, like, what's an activity that you want to do? Um, And he said, I want to do woodworking. So I went online (laughs) and I looked up this company that does little woodworking projects. And I said, okay, this is going to be our thing. And it's something that we're going to try to do consistently. I think reading to the kids um, at night um, and just knowing like, okay, we're going to have this time where we're going to read out loud and we're going to really get into, like, I think we read the first three Harry Potter books Mm -hmm. during COVID. Um, The fourth one becomes scary. Right. Yeah, I, That's I when decided, it becomes a little scary for that age group. <laughs> I decided let's take a little Harry Potter break exactly. and like read other things. Um, so, you know, just trying to find these things that, you, you know, are your thing. And, you know, obviously you're going to have dinner time. Actually, I talked to a school psychologist yesterday. I don't know if you all heard about this, but I loved um, this thing that she does with her kids at dinner time. Some people do it at bedtime. It's called Rose Thornbud. Have you heard about this? No. 
Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah, it's kind of like sell us something that is a, a positive, a negative, yeah. or something. Yeah, I love that. So the rose is something good that happened during your day. Uh, the thorn is something bad and the bud is something that you're either looking forward to or you're anxious about. And I just thought that was such a cute icebreaker. Yes. A lot of times if you just ask your kids, like what happened that- today? Or, How was your exactly. day? Like, the what I'll say, nothing, nothing. Yeah. I literally teenager, did like, nothing, nothing today. Are talking about why are you talking to me? <laughs> exactly. Don't make <laughs> eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. I'm going to try it. Yeah. that's awesome we try to prioritize family dinner so like mm-hmm. as much as possible like eating together that's awesome but, yeah. um I don't do any of those things uh my icebreaker is movies and ice cream you love know, it sometimes they'll just you know how if you want a kid to talk put them in a situation where you're not supposed to and they will. So like the movies always, um, we just watch them at home together and I can't ever, I have to put the subtitles on, not because I'm almost deaf now that I'm older. It's because my kids are talking in my ears. <laughs> um, so again, I'm always, um, and, and, and Zeba will confirm this. Like I'm always looking for the conspiracy, right? Cause I feel like there's always one. So not that I'm a huge conspiracy theorist, but I feel like there's always an agenda. So she's a huge, comp- she is a huge conspiracy. <laughs> I don't know what she's talking about. Everything has a conspiracy. I'm like, it could just be blue. It doesn't have to be, there's a reason behind the blue. It should, could just be, let's take it for face value. Well, why but blue? I love that about all her. the choices. <laughs> so the, I would like the truth from somebody who's been in the industry for as long mm-hmm. as you have. What is the news industry's agenda? for and about Muslims. Because like you said, not everything that makes the news is newsworthy and not everything that doesn't make the news isn't newsworthy. Who's making those decisions? And, you know, how do we break that egg? I don't know if it's an egg. I don't know if it's a giant, you know, lead box that we have to get into, but I feel like something is there that is preventing coverage of people of color, Muslims in particular. So there's no conspiracy necessarily. I think, you know, the news media is a group of individuals. Most of them are pretty highly educated. Many of them come from pretty elite backgrounds. Um, As I mentioned, it's an industry that's really challenging to break into. Oftentimes you're working on like poverty wages in your first few jobs, especially even um, depending on the, the news organization, you could be well into your career and not making that much money. So a lot of people go into journalism, have family support, family money come from like pretty privileged backgrounds. So you're automatically kind of filtering in um, people with a very specific worldview. Um, Things are changing as far as having a Muslim presence in in newsrooms and media, but it's still pretty small. I think, um, you know, people are, um, people's perspectives uh, are what they are, right? So if you're coming from a background where you not, haven't necessarily met Muslims or know much about Muslims or Islam, or you have your own kind of biases and agendas about who Muslims are and what they stand for, then that's going to impact your journalism, right? And I think a big example of this that we saw uh, that kind of um, broke a story that broke open last fall is this New York Times podcast, Caliphate which was a huge blockbuster podcast. Everybody and their mom was listening to it. It won a Peabody Award. It won all these awards. And then it turned out, and it was based on the testimony of a guy who claimed that he joined ISIS. Uh, The reporter, Rukmini Kalamaki, was, in my opinion, her coverage on ISIS was woefully um, inadequate. It was biased. It was sensationalistic more than anything. And unfortunately, it was very impactful, right? Like so many people were reading what she had to write about ISIS and listening to this podcast. And it turned out that her main character, Abu Huzaifa, actually made up the whole story. He'd never traveled to Syria. He'd never joined ISIS. And um, in my opinion, part of the reason she fell for his tall tales is because she wanted to tell a very sensationalistic story about a a Westerner from Canada who joins ISIS and he liked Star Wars. And like basically the underlying premise being your Muslim next door neighbor who's brown can be a member of ISIS, like beware. And I think all that does is create um, fear and anxiety and, and it's a sensationalistic way of storytelling that doesn't actually inform or educate, but it causes people to be afraid or, or it titillate, you know, it like excites you. It, um, 
you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's like eating, I don't know, junk food, right? Like it's not actually useful. It's just entertaining. And I think, you know, one thing she does, she starts out the whole podcast by talking about how one day she was convinced that ISIS came to her door and it was because there was knocking on her door And someone was like, open up, open up. And it turned out that a water main had broken in her neighborhood. But she was like, I've been told that like ISIS wanted to kill me. And um, that's why. And, you know, I think I think that this specific reporter's work has a pattern of overemphasizing religion and the role of religious ideology and underemphasizing, undercovering the geopolitical context of what actually led to an organization like ISIS being created, right? Which is the illegal and immoral invasion of Iraq, the destruction of that country's infrastructure, the destabilization of the entire region around Iraq. Like it's not just Iraq, it's the whole Middle East that became, right? And and the majority of ISIS members were actually Iraqis (laughs) or Syrians, you know? people who were from that region that happened to be completely destabilized. The origins of ISIS, according to even former intelligence officials, uh, were in Iraqi prisons after the uh, invasion occupation of Iraq. So none of that important context actually makes it into this coverage. Instead, you have stories about how Muslims are terrorists. Um, And I think it's not a conspiracy. I think it's... um, It's decisions made by people in power to tell a story a certain way because they think that because it either reinforces their worldview or confirms their biases or because, frankly, you don't have Muslims who are necessarily and not just any Muslims, because let's be real, there's Muslims who are willing to kind of play into these biases, play into these stereotypes, tell the stories that they think their editors or their news organizations want told. But people who genuinely come from that background who want to tell an honest story, a nuanced story, a complicated story. And I think as long as you don't have those voices, not only present, but heard, but centered, then you're going to continue having kind of problematic reporting like this. Yeah. And I think we soapbox the caliphate about how the New York Times like still freaking has it up, even though they've, you know, retracted and said, okay, we were wrong. Well, if it's wrong and you are a reputable news organization, take it um, down, publication, take it down. So um, we put the petition up. It's still up there. You know, it's still, you can Google search it right now. Um, I guess the reason why I feel it, you know, and I, I think I'm saying conspiracy, but you're saying there is, a pattern of trying to confirm the biases that you already have. So basically Mm -hmm. you're already racist. Now you have to prove why you're not um, because these people really are evil. Um, I think the reason why that's even more possible is because a lot of our mainstream media is owned by bazillionaires, right? Like Bezos owns the Washington post. We have the Murdoch's, we have the Adelson's, we have the Cox family and whatever biases they have they're going to push those forward, right? So like way back in the day during Watergate, the only reason that opened, I think, was because the post was run by a woman who didn't like Nixon, you know? So it was okay to run those stories. If you like somebody, then, you know, alternatively, you might hide that story or maybe not run that story or maybe not run the whole story. And so that's why I think it's really, really important that we have, you know, people like you in the media to unearth those stories that are being buried and to bring back the focus on things like, you know, I remember being shocked. Was it in 2000 when Mohamed Dura was shot like on TV, like right there by the IDF while his dad is covering him up. And the, I think there was a French reporter who was trying to talk about it and getting all choked up about it. But even the European focus on that was contested so hotly by Israel, the story died. Like, I think within that week, you know, that a child was killed in cold blood, was not armed, complete civilians who were shot by a militarized police with all the cameras on and nothing ever happened of it. And still we have after that, way after that was the blockade of Gaza. And then, you know, all the atrocities that have happened since that continue to happen today. So it's why isn't it being covered? And I think it is ultimately it's racism, you know, and that is an agenda that we need to undo and unearth. And the only way we can do it is by getting inside. Yeah, absolutely. I think unfortunately too often, especially when it comes to foreign uh, coverage or international coverage, 
um, U.S. journalists approach everything from the prism of like the national security state or U.S. foreign policy, right? So your perspective of issue X perfectly aligns with what the State Department is saying rather than truly approaching something objectively and trying to find out the truth. And I think, um, you know, it can be a lot better to say the least. Well, it could be a lot better by like, let's just be real as parents of the next generation. We don't all have to be doctors and lawyers and people in those types of quote unquote traditional fields. We should allow our children the opportunity to explore some of these non-mainstream, and I'm using this in quotation marks, because like you said, it's not the most um, financially savvy, like in the beginning until you're starting to make it, but it's just as equally as important. So I want to tell these moms and dads, like your kid comes to you and says, I want to be a journalist. I want to try to, you know, put my point of view out there. Let's try to encourage them and help support them in the way that we can, because not all of us can be doctors and lawyers and bankers or whatever it is that we want to be. Some some of us want to kind of be on the inside um, and kind of make this impact um, by creating a platform where we can have a different point of view, because that's, I feel like the only way we can help change the narrative if we are part of the conversation. And if we're not, we don't have a seat at the table. I don't think that's ever going to happen. That's absolutely true. I don't think I could have done this without the support and encouragement of my parents. And I think in some ways, like they're not your typical immigrant parents because my, I mean, my dad was a professor, right? Like he didn't necessarily enter a lucrative field himself. So I think for, in my family, in my home, it was always like, what can we do to make the world better? Um, What can we do to help people? What can we do um, to help people understand a perspective that's often too often lost or buried? And, you know, I I hope to do the same for my kids. It's easier said than done once you become a parent, because you're like, well, I want my kid to like, you know, survive in the world. But so much of it is it's, it's about letting go of control and, you know, just having this hope that they'll be OK, no matter what they do. And they'll find their way. Inshallah, control your mouth status. to God's Eve. Yeah. yeah. Status is key. We don't all I mean, and, and you're not going to like you said, there are certain people in the media that um, went there because they're kind of re. Um, emphasizing what people are naturally already thinking. So it takes a lot to kind of go against the grain to kind of be like, I'm not going to state this particular narrative. I'm going to tell you the truth. And a lot of times we're punished for it. And, you know, Usman and I have provided, we're, we're lucky in that sense where we're kind of like, you know, we recognize that there are certain people that cannot speak out, cannot speak forward. So we're going to help do that for you because we don't, we're not being penalized, right? And we're, we're lucky where that is concerned. So we can try to bring forth this, this um, particular paradigm because I don't necessarily think it's for everybody to kind of speak the truth because you do get penalized or you lose your job or whatever. But I know for you, you know, you talked about having, um, you know, you start your work day early, you're trying to incorporate some of this uh, family time. But for people like, for instance, my daughter is thinking potentially of journalism, you know, so I, she's either wants to be an actress Okay. Or journalism, which I'm kind of trying America, to America, it's towards. the same thing. <laughs> In America, it's the same thing. Okay, let's just be real. But, you know, what does that typical work day look like for you? I think it really depends on what you're doing within journalism. Like, um, I have my younger sister actually works for Vice News. Just putting in a plug, she did some incredible work out of Palestine in May. Um, Check out her documentaries. Maybe you guys can link them. But if you really want to know what's happening, um, they did one on Sheikh Jarrah, which is a neighborhood in East Jerusalem where Israeli settlers are trying to forcibly take over Palestinian homes. Um, you know, uh, 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 like with the um, courts, <laughs> sort of with the state's backing. Um, she also did a really moving documentary out of Gaza after the war. Um, so my sister, um, she's in her late 20s. She travels all over the Middle East. She's based in Beirut, um, but travels all over. So she obviously has, uh, you know, a much busier schedule as far as like just travel and going from here to there and covering stories. I think so, you know, if you're a print reporter covering, a, you know, a certain beat, then it depends on what that beat is, where you're based, what your the expectations of your editors are. So it depends on if you're someone who's in the field where you have kind of a lot less control over your schedule or someone who's, um, for example, uh, 
you know, doing a more administrative job or oversight job, like an editor. Um, so for me, when I became a mother, I started going more in the track of like not being in the field as much because my husband was traveling so much. And I knew that I didn't want both of us to be traveling so much and for my kids to be raised by someone else, <laughs> frankly, like I wanted them to always have a parent. So even though I love being in the field, at least when they were young, I, I knew that I had to be around more and I kind of, um, you know, sort of switched my career more in that direction, even though it's not necessarily my passion, but I wanted to, you know, sort of do what's best for them. Um, so for me, a typical work day is, um, looking, you know, doing some administrative work, um, but also looking over scripts or uh, rough cuts that my teams are working on. Um, if a team is in the field, um, answering any questions I might have or giving guidance, having story meetings before the teams um, go out uh, to start filming. Um, so it really runs the gamut. It's a lot of um, having phone calls. I'm not a big Zoom person. I prefer phone calls. But um, so it just depends. And, um, you know, sort of like looking over scripts, editing, looking over rough cuts, um, figuring out like what stories to do and like reading up, doing a lot of research, reading up on why should we do this story? Would this make the best documentary? Should we do another story? So a lot of computer time. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think there are so many different jobs that someone can do within the field. So it really just depends on the job and what kind of their lifestyle would look like. Yeah. And don't be afraid to have your job cater to your particular lifestyle. Because I think a lot of people think that, oh, if I don't go hard and go strong, regardless of where my kids are in their developmental stage, then I'm going to miss my opportunity. But I feel like that limits um you know, really, I think that the problem there is that you think that Allah is limited and that he's not going to keep providing you those opportunities. He will, especially when you prioritize whatever's important to you at that time, if it's your family or if it's your religion, I feel like you always get rewarded for that. It may not happen immediately, but it'll come, you know, inshallah. And then I think in 10, 15 years, we're going to see you back out in the field. I'm really excited about that. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. I'd like that. Um, yeah. By then, the kids won't want to maybe talk to so it's okay. <laughs> but then maybe we can join you and we can be like, mommy, while well, I'm behind the yes. scenes, I'm putting oh it gosh. out there right now. That yeah. would be awesome. That's That'd awesome. Be awesome. So what's your favorite story that you've covered so far? And it doesn't have to be just limited to fault lines, but just yeah. in your career. If that's too broad, then yeah, on, on fault lines. Yeah, that's a good question. There have been so many. And I think part of what's really cool about journalism is you end up in places that you never expected to end up in. So, um, you like know, mommying. From, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, um, you know, one time I went to, um, a hospital where I attended like a support group for, um, women who are pregnant, but also were struggling with opioid addiction. Um, so you really get in the door of places that you would never end up or situations you'd never, you know, an abortion clinic, a, um, you know, what else, um, just so many different scenarios, like, um, yeah, like a, a factory making clothes in Bangladesh, like whatever it is, it's never dull. <laughs> and, you know, it's um, always educational. It's always, you know, rehab clinics, like whatever it is, but probably the most like personally impactful story I worked on was called The Ban. It was about a Syrian refugee family that was slated to come to the US. And then the Muslim ban came into effect and uh, their travel plans were paused. And they had two very sick children who had these autoimmune, uh, like genetic disorders. And the older one who's age six ended up deteriorating, going into the ICU uh, in a Turkish hospital. We fle flew to Istanbul to tell their story. And tragically on the last day that we were there, um, their son passed away. And I think it was very just personally heart wrenching story to work on. Um, but just the parent, his parents commitment to telling their story so that maybe they'll make people care and feel something um, was just something to behold during, you know, the toughest moment of their life. And, you know, I was, um, really grateful to them to be able to tell their story during, you know, such a horrible time in their life. And, you know, um, we were very thankful in that the story got seen by a lot of people. Actually, the president of Turkey heard about their case and moved their younger son uh, to a better hospital and ensured that they got good care. And eventually 
the UN actually expedited their case and they were resettled in Germany. Um, but it was just, you know, really difficult to tell, but also really meaningful. Yeah, no, I remember that story when you told it. Um, and that uh, meant a lot to all of us, because I think when you're alluding to the ban, it was the what that entailed was the delay of care or was it that his parents weren't allowed to get to his bedside? Um, it, they wanted to come to the U.S. as Syrian refugees who were like approved, vetted for many years. And um, it was the Trump administration's Muslim ban Band, that yeah. didn't allow them to come here. Mm -hmm. And instead, they had to stay in Turkey. And then, you know, the father believes that like the news that they weren't coming really impacted their son um, and, and his condition ended up deteriorating. Um, but, you know, it's just life for refugees, like you're constantly struggling. And then on top of it, if, if your children have medical um, challenges, like it's, yeah, it's on another level, but yeah, absolutely. Well, I have to say, you know, this was a long time in coming because I know it was just one of these things where I'm like, I have to create a series so that Layla can come on and <laughs> be, just because I love everything that you did. And the funny thing is, you know, we were friends. I didn't know who you were and I feel bad because I never actually Google people. And it wasn't until I was interviewing your sister and then I was doing research that I texted you and I'm like, oh my God, I'm really sorry. You probably think I'm the biggest moron in the world because I do not Google my friends. And so I, I think that that's super funny and the, and I wanted to end this with a, we're going to do rapid fire, but the, my first time meeting you, we were actually in our school and I'm not going to name the name and we were at open house or something. And then the lady comes up to you and she's like, would you like an ES? It was like an ESL paperwork um, in Arabic. Cause she, I don't think she thought you were like a native. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this lady is an award-winning journalist and trying to ask her if she speaks English. So thank you so much for you know, keep pushing our point of view to keep representing us because that's exactly what we need right now. And part of what we do when we end our series is to kind of do a rapid fire where I kind of ask you quick questions. So I'm going to be do, doing the question asking. I know normally it's you, so I'm flipping this around and Uzma setting a timer for one minute and we're going to try to get to know you a little bit differently than other people do. Are you ready? I think Layla. so. I'm kind of scared. But oh, it is scary. Oh my. <laughs> like not, first thing that, that pops in your mind. That's all you it's have to say. First thing that pops in your mind. Okay. So you alluded to um, reading, you were a college major where you read all these American novels. What was your favorite one? Oh, well, I'll just say who my favorite author is. Toni Morrison. Love oh, her. I love her. I love her. I love her. And you know, being a journalist, I would love to know what is your favorite word? Oh, ubiquitous? It's just the word that came in. Oh, I have a pretty big that. word. I like that word. I love that job. So what is your most used emoji when you're texting people? Okay, this is embarrassing because apparently the Zoomers think this is a very dorky emoji. But the laugh cry one. I love that one. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with that one? Oh no, they they think it's a bad one. They like they, the, the the dead one instead. Yes, exactly. To mean, to mean that's funny. Oh. But I mean, can you believe this? Okay, so what is your hidden talent? We know all of your mm. non-hidden talents, but what is something you don't want people to know about you? Well, I was a brown belt of taekwondo, and also when Ooh. I ever whenever I want to impress my kids, I spin the basketball on my finger. Oh, that is actually that a really is good. Huge. I like that is huge. Because remember, Mezen's going to be an NBA player, so I am really you know? excited about that. Can we talk about keeping expectations in check? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, you spoke a lot about your parents and being integral in who you are today, but what is the one thing that you can say your parents, your mother or father, father taught you that kind of completely changed your life? Oh, wow. I think whenever I would feel sorry for myself, they would tell us to have perspective and that there's people yes. out there suffering a lot more than we are. And I think about that all the time, um, not to diminish your own feelings and what you're going through, but to just be grounded and really remind yourself that of all the blessings and privileges you have. And, and that's the beauty of being Muslim, right? Because every time we put our head down on the floor, mm -hmm. we're all doing the same thing and we're all in the same position. And that really does put your humbleness into perspective. So that is an amazing thing your parent taught. And I think we we made the minute, didn't we? Osma? We did. Yeah. We just barely we made the we minute. We went two seconds over. 
but that's okay. <laughs> but that's okay. But you know, I am very much looking forward to seeing you back when we get home and prayers mm-hmm. and blessings to everybody. I really appreciate you being on the show today. And this was another episode of Mommy Well Muslim. Thanks so much, Layla. Thank, Thank you for everyone. having me. Thank you. One of our sponsors this month is Guidance Residential. Take advantage of their spring refinance special and get $500 off with your refinancing. Go to gr.link backslash ram underscore mwm underscore 2021.